So, nach zweieinhalb Jahren. Well, after two and a half years of an hiatus, we are back here in Davos. And I am overjoyed to be able to welcome you here to our open forum in May 2022. As you can see, we, have, uh, we are here in a new location this year. Usually we are in the school location, but at this moment, uh, students are sitting exams, so we have our fingers crossed for all of those students sitting their exams today. The forum this year will be dedicated to a number of different subjects. Of course, we will talk about the COVID pandemic, about the ripple effects that this pandemic will have, about the Russian troops uh, in Ukraine, but we will also talk about the role of our international community where Europe stands today about climate change and many other challenges. As every year, we will listen to a number of different voices here as part of the Open Forum. One example is the session Mental Health for Young People. This session was uh, um, prepared together with students from Geneva, and they will also help moderate this session. We will also introduce a member of the Global Shapers community as each as members of each session. What is this community? It's a number of people who are younger than 30 years old and come from all walks uh, and, and backgrounds of life. We will also be able to welcome a young woman from Ukraine who has opened uh, the so-called Shapers Hub in Ukraine. She uses this platform to support uh, people who were displaced by this war. I am overjoyed to be able to welcome Vitaly Klitschko, Kiev's mayor, and his brother, Vladimir. Both of them will talk about the effects that the Russian invasion had on both them and their country. Vitaly Klitschko and Vladimir Klitschko on stage, together with the moderator, Haslinda, from Singapore. We're really honored that you're here with us, that you take time out of your busy schedules and share with us what the situation there is. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd love for it to be interactive, so you'll have a chance to ask your questions later on in the conversation. We'll also love for you to be involved in uh, the social media sphere, so please do tweet or um, engage on uh, LinkedIn and so on and so forth, and uh, some hashtags to remember. It's hashtag WEF22 as well as hashtag open forum. Uh, we'd love for you to participate. Now, it was about three months ago that Russia attacked Ukraine in the early hours of the morning. And three months on, it's become the worst war in Europe since World War II. More than 10 million people have been displaced. Thousands have died. Thousands more have been injured. And right now, there is no end in sight. The war persists three months on. This often forum hopes to give you a feel of what it is 
on the ground, get a first-hand experience from the two brothers. I'm sure you're well acquainted. Between them, they have um, 40 global titles, so I've never felt safer. Uh, but they've never fought each other because it is a promise that they made to their mother. They've never fought each other. That's right. Vitaly, Vladimir, <laughs> good to have you with us. First off, give us a sense, three months on, how it is like on the ground. What's morale like? What's the mood on the ground, Vitaly? Can I, uh, can I start? In? First of all, first of all, it's good to see you, every one of you. Great atmosphere, mounds, sunshine, spring almost finished and right now summertime. Everybody have a plans to vacation. The peaceful atmosphere is the same time, a couple of thousand kilometers from here, died every day people. Young people, old people, women, children died. It's difficult to compare it right now as a great peaceful atmosphere and war somewhere else. It's difficult to understand that. First of all, a couple of minutes. I, I know it's, we have 30 minutes time for this panel. panel. That's why I try to put whole information. Uh, everyone have to understand the reason of this senseless war. The reason we Ukrainian want to build a democratic country, want to be the part of European family, it doesn't accept from Russian Federation. They, they see Ukraine as part of Russian empire. It's a very important puzzle and vision of Mr. Putin uh, to rebuild Soviet Union. They're talking right now in Kremlin about Baltic countries, Poland, former Soviet Empire, and uh, <clears throat> is a reason. Is a reason. And everyone have to understand. Right now, the Russians break all, all uh, rules, uh, <clears throat> break all principles, and uh, it's not the war. First of all, never believe in Russia. They always cheating. Coming back, 1994, Ukraine was third country in the world with nuclear weapons. We give up uh, our nuclear weapons as goodwill with a guarantee our independence and integrity. And Russians was one of the countries who give to us the guarantee. Fact. Crime annexion. Annex annexia of Crime. The, everybody know from beginning the Russians stay behind that and the people uh, with military uniform without identification is what the Russians told us. No, no, it's not our military. They was. And everyone know that. The Nest, Lugansk, the Russians told, told us it's civil war. But everyone know, without money support, without propaganda, without, without uh, the weapons delivering to this region, it's never, never, never ever happens, this conflict. Right now, the Russians told special operation against the military forces. Saints God in Kyiv was a lot of international journalists. They immediately go to Bucha, Erpen, Borodyanka and see the horrible images of liar, special operation, killing children, women, old people, destroy the cities. The Russians told they it's denazification activity. The uh, people coming to government, Nazis, radicals, fascists, who headed Russians, who make a pressure to the Russians. I told to uh, my friends in Russia who told me that, sorry, we are both, 
in our bodies half of Russian blood because our mom is Russian. We have nothing against Russian nationality. We have a lot against Russian aggressive politics. 70 nations live in Ukraine. Ukraine always peaceful country. We live peaceful people. We never was aggressive to anyone. But right now, right now we have to fight and have to defend. And also one message is Ukraine surprised many in the world. We stay in the front of one of the strongest army in the world, Russian army. And how we fighting so tough? Simple explanation. We Ukrainian defending our children, families, our future, future of our children. And Russian soldier fighting for the money. Give question for yourself. Are you ready to, to die for the money? Or are you ready to die for your children and your family? The simple answer. Why Ukrainian soldier fighting so tough? We defending our country, city, families, and future of our children. Vladimir, Sorry, yeah. Let me just pose a question to Vladimir. I mean, we talk about fighting, resisting, and I think the Russians themselves have been surprised by, by the resistance from Ukraine. Talk to us about how much longer the Ukrainians can fight for their country, considering the bombardment that continues. It is, first of all, a good day here in Davos. A uh, peaceful day. This fighting will remain as long as we're alive. We are Ukrainians, and I believe we're over 65 million Ukrainians around the world, and 45-ish in the country. Uh, there are probably 10-ish uh, refugees that left the country, moved out of the country, relocated. Um, there are families, as you heard from the mayor, families, friends, relatives, are connected with each other, and when someone really gets into your home and trying to replace you, trying to destroy your life, as it was done um, in Bucha, Gostomil, Irpin, Makarev, Ivankiv, Mariupol, Kharkiv, we can count endlessly. We don't know how many, I mentioned how many have been removed from their permanent places, we don't know how many have been killed, thousands and thousands. It's really impossible to count. And how many more are killed today while we're speaking, sitting here, going to be until this war is going to come to an end and the war is going to come to an end. There is always a beginning and an end of everything in life and life itself. So it's going to be with the war. Question is, how long is going to last? It's going to, to, to be last as long as we, so-called free world, will continue support, meaning having any trade with Russia and not isolate Russia economically, politically. On the athletic side, here in Switzerland is the headquarter of the IOC, International Olympic Committee, and I believe that Russian Olympic team must be banned and not participate Already today, it must be confirmed. Nothing is the nationality or against the athletes, but they represent the regime of Russia, this aggressive regime that has started the senseless war. As long as Russia will not, as, as long as Russia will not understand the war that have, they have started, is not just senseless. It it destroys life of others, of the rest of the world, and also it really hurts them. Russia is throwing themselves in the time machine, so, so to speak, probably 50 years behind, because the world is isolating them. This isolation will cause tremendously expensive, have the tremendously expensive cost on development of Russia itself. It's going to slow down us, but we must show it with one front that we are 
against this politics, this policy, this war, that there's no guarantee you're gonna roll further as Russian propaganda has announced already that, that Ukraine is only just the beginning. So obviously, speaking of the ambitious of Soviet empire, so to speak, probably Romania, Moldova, Poland, um, other countries, DDR, so-called back then in Soviet time, might end up be a point of interest of the Russian aggression, which has been already, as I said, in their propaganda announced. So I believe we should take this really seriously. And I know it's so tough to read the news and um, have empathy for someone that you really don't feel, that you did really didn't see, didn't smell, as we had it to see and observe uh, in Bucha, where civilians, teenagers, been tortured. You could see that. Their hands were behind their back. They were on their knee, executed with a headshot. In underground, on the streets, in the car. The car with the civilians that had been driven, uh, their children or a family in this car. And there was clearly put a sign, children was smashed by the tank, flattened. You could see the remains of the bodies of the civilians. And this so-called special operation is not against other army. And listening and knowing the propaganda, Ukraine was a mistake of the history. Just, just understand it, what Russian propaganda is saying. We Ukrainians, our mistake of the history. Basically, we shouldn't exist. What is happening in Ukraine, it's a war crime. And this justification through media, of course, their weapons, their chemical weapons, their nuclear weapons, but I believe that the most dangerous weapon is media, state-controlled media. Guess what? I watched TV this morning. Russian TV, yes, here in Switzerland. Russian TV in my hotel room. And do you know what I saw there? Mariupol, Ukrainian city that has been completely destroyed by the Ukrainians. Thousands of the civilians being killed by the Ukrainians. My jaw dropped off. How could that happen? And how this ban this isolation of this propaganda that destroying the person from the inside out. And probably those soldiers, not just they're going for money, but they're also brainwashed. Their brain is poisoned with the propaganda. They believe they're fighting fascists and Nazis. And who knows? what other justification is, why they're doing it and killing. So, and I believe, especially here in Switzerland, and Swiss always been neutral to a lot of conflicts and just trying to stay away of, of that. And um, I would say kinda understandably when two armies are fighting each other, the third party cannot be involved. But when, a, when an army is destroying infrastructure. We have five nuclear power plants, five, and with multiple reactors. And one of them that has been captured by the Russian army and holding as a hostage in the Parisian region, and Ergadan is the city. It's so big that if that goes off, and this is the biggest European, if not the world's power plant. Rockets were flying above it. The fire was extinguished just there was a, a month ago. So all fighting and grenades and everything was landing right next to those reactors. 
the consequence is going to be severe as world leaders of the free world announced it before the Russia invaded Ukraine. If Russia crossed the line, and I remember Joe Biden said it, and many others confirmed, Russia is going to have severe consequences. Those severe consequences have been taken by the Ukrainians for like two months. Slowly, slowly, the world is realizing all those lies, justification of Russia, why they invade Ukraine, business, because we're all depending on the Russian oil and gas energy. We're like drug addicts, gas and oil addicts and coal that have been provided because it's so simple to get it from Russia, but we never thought about alternatives. And now Russia is using it, as we see with other countries like Baltic countries, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, Poland, that have been turned off the gas, Russian gas. And I believe that the world must wake up even earlier, but thankfully, better later than never. And the sooner we realize, the sooner we will realize that this war is not just somewhere in Ukraine, a few thousand kilometers from here, more or less. It's going to touch us and this war is going to knock on our door. And I have to repeat these words that was said by the Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky, uh, just a moment ago. And it's just like waking up and asking yourself, what have I done to support Ukraine? And it's not just always, sometimes I'm like thinking that we always, we Ukrainians, asking for help with a stretched hand. Help us, help us. Yes, we are screaming for help. We need it. How much do you need? When is it enough? It's never enough as long as this war is still going. So in the short term, Vitaly, what would you like to see from the US, from European allies, from the rest of the world, beyond funds, perhaps in terms of capacity, what would you like to see? Everyone have to understand, we fighting, I told, we fighting for our country, defending our city, defending our family and children. But every one of you have to understand, we defending you personally, we fighting for values. I hope we same values, democratic values. Where is main values is the human rights, human life. We fighting actually for every one of you, and everyone have to understand that. And right now, everyone have to be proactive because we pay for that, the biggest price, human life, every day, hundreds of them, every day. Uh, it's, it's very important to stay with Ukraine. Weapons is very important. We stay in front of the one strongest army in the world. Political support, economic support, but because we fighting first of all for values, and in beginning my speech I told the, our goal, the reason of this war, to be the part of democratic family, to be the part of democratic world. It's, it's very important everyone have to understand that. And I'm more than sure this war can touch everyone in everyone in Europe feel that everyone in Europe can touch and Vladimir told if I hope not five power nuclear plants in uh, in Ukraine if the explosion will be in the front of the line power plants 
uh, nuclear power plants explosion will be times bigger than catastrophe in, in Chernobyl. And after that can touch everyone. And right now the Russians told, talking about, I hope not, chemical weapon, nuclear weapon, and many, many experts told, actually, the man who decide to start the, this war, I'm more than sure, he's unhealthy. If they starting this war, they can touch also the button which connected with nuclear weapons also, because the man is unhealthy. To break the drama, to, bring, uh, uh, to millions of people in Europe, to destroy all international rules, all principles, difficult to understand. Vladimir, you talked about how the Ukrainians are willing to fight the long fight. Do you get a sense that the Western world is unprepared for that? Because when you take a look at the peace proposals that have been submitted by the likes of Italy, for instance, it does seem like the Western world wants Ukraine to come up with some kind of compromises to end the war. What is the sense you're getting? I believe, well, it has two th two sides. The longer this war is going, please forgive me, the better it is. On the, which side? Understanding, as I mentioned before, two months it took to the free world to understand that weapons need to be delivered. If we would have been talking about it like three days, that's how long this war must last in the thoughts of the, of the, of the Russia and their intelligence was horrible. It just shows how, how corrupted the country is, Russia, in this case. Their intelligence were so bad, informed, or didn't really. They just wanted to maybe just uh, uh, satisfy the, the commander with, with the will and stuff. But the longer it goes, the more the world understands that must be stopped. The sooner, the better. But what is the soon? How, how, how soon is going to come this, this end? We don't know. That's the a positive and the negative. Negative with the war and the positive that, that the world is waking up. And it takes time, unfortunately. It takes life, unfortunately. And peace with any price, that's what actually I hear from you with this question. Like, we need peace now. Like, just give up the land that they wanted and, um, or maybe give up at all. Then we have peace and we can do business and we get our gas and our homes are going to be warm in the winter and so on. No, it's not that simple. If we give in in this war, and I say we, the free world, give in, trust me, this is the beginning of the end. If we don't let the aggressor pay for the co as consequence, pay with severe consequences with this, for this aggression, the lesson is not going to be learned. We need to learn after this war is going to come to an end, and it will, as I said. We need to learn and study why this war happened and why it's going to happen again, if not by Russia, but someone else maybe. Why all of a sudden, and we've done it already after the Second World War, territories that belong to, uh, to Poland or Germany or, or like Lemberg and Lviv to, to um, Hungary or, or, or Ukraine. Or, so we're going to start it again. That means the lesson after the Second World War has not been learned. So I believe that now propaganda must be banned internationally. State-owned media only must be banned. We can endlessly count on all the lies and not true facts, not having a chance to, ac to like free access of internet. And we've heard that Russia is just like cutting, cutting the ends. Of, of any information that can possibly come from free world because they must 
dictatorship in this case is just the worst case. Eventually, it's not going to last long. And people are going to suffer, not just in the country where this dictatorship is going, but also in the countries where others are connected through energy supply, for, uh, for instance. That's why I believe that um, we, we must learn from, with this war, while this war is still going, we must learn. Uh, we need to wake up earlier than, than later. We need to act together. We need to have endurance. It takes endurance. As a former athlete, I'm going to tell you, I've been holding, do something good and talk about it, I've been holding the titles the longest in history as a heavyweight champion. And I've learned one thing. Endurance beats talent and masterpiece. Endurance. And it's exactly, we understand it's not going to be soon, and we understand eventually we will, once and for a long time, if not forever, we will defend our democratic principles in Ukraine and show to the world that everyone in the future is going to try to do the same, going to pay severe, for real, not just with the worst consequences. And if it's not going to be done now, when? And if it's not going to be us, then who? And it's extremely important to get it done now. An example is Ukraine. An example is this senseless aggression. And I believe if we act together, we will have the end of the war very soon. We're capable of it. We know how to get it done. We just cannot be cowards showing back to this challenge. We must show face and face the consequences. Yes, it's going to be tough to change and get rid of Russian gas and oil and coal. Yeah, probably we need to one or two degrees as it was scientifically proved. Maybe going to be a little colder in our living room, an apartment or home. But we're going to save lives with that and eventually also future for our Next, gener next generations. And I think it, it is important to do it now and not just silently observe it and being scared of whatever is going on right now in Ukraine. Some say bitterly that Ukraine at this point has already won because it's resisted and it's caused casualties in Russia. But obviously, the war has not been won by Ukraine. In your assessment of what a win looks like, give us a sense of what needs to be achieved before you can say Ukraine has won the war? First of all, many times ask me the biggest wish. Myself, I guess every one of 50 million Ukrainians right now have exactly the same peace back to Ukraine. And uh, Russians talk right now, let's talking about solution, compromise. I don't know what they talk about. Which compromise? Give up the part of territory? It's compromise. It's not some compromise. We uh, don't ready to talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> our main priority right now, stop the war. The last soldier have to leave Ukraine our territory and uh, our territorial independence and, and territorial and, uh, integrity. It's main priority for us. And after that, the best what we have to do it, give the services to all Ukrainians to bring the investment to develop the country. Uh, actually, my dream uh, before the war, I told to make my hometown, capital of Ukraine, great example to another cities and villages, and everyone have to say, we want to take exactly the same services uh, as in Kyiv, to great infrastructure, to great life. Uh, and right now we're done talking about that, right now it's a totally different priority, right now stop the war, peace back to Ukraine. When this happens, we don't know. Vladimir talk about that right now. Um, actually, everything depends from the somebody who's starting this war and can uh, this person can stop in this war any second. But to be realistic and objective, he doesn't have another choice. 
we have to fight and defend our future. And we need help, we need support from our friends. And that's why thank you, for, uh, thank you very much for everyone who supports Ukraine. It is a humanitarian catastrophe. Critical uh, infrastructure has been destroyed, schools, homes. We know that talks are already underway with the IMF and the World Bank to talk about reconstruction even before the war ends. It's perhaps too early, but in your view, how should that be looked at? How do you look at reconstructing Ukraine, Kyiv, and everything that's been destroyed? Uh, actually, from beginning of the war, it's destroyed more than, more than uh, 300 buildings, uh, two more than 200 apartments buildings, uh, killed uh, more than 120 uh, civilians, four children killed, 16 children was injured and was in hospitals. Um, but much more worse situation in Chernigiv, Bucha, Gostom, Lerpen, these small cities totally destroyed around Kyiv. They, they protect, the city protect Kyiv. If not, this city is exactly the same. Horrible images will be from our hometown. It's horrible. Thanks God we have international journalists in, in uh, our city. They immediately make world report what was going on. What, but we don't have international journalists in Mariupol in uh, Kharkiv, in Slavyansk, uh, Rubizhne, small cities, and uh, there is really uh, catastrophe. People need medication, food. They homeless right now. They th doesn't have a job. They have to survive, and uh, it's the next challenge. For us, we help a lot, and thank you very much for everyone who sent humanitarian help to Ukraine. We need that uh, in, in other city. Kyiv is uh, in safe. Kyiv, uh, we control whole situation. It's everything's fine, but uh, small cities they 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 need that. On a personal basis, I know that both of you have gone through huge challenges in life, Chernobyl the Iron Curtain. How would you describe your experience now fighting the war against Russia compared to what you've gone through before? I believe, I believe it's not just us. Um, I believe, well, uh, in a certain degree, uh, there are Ukrainians that are on the front line. They've been um, injured and they've seen, they've seen their, their friends, or family members being killed. And we, 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 we hear these horrible stories with horrible images. Now, it's public information and investigation from international court is still going on and will continue Definitely. on all the horror of the war. And it's not to compare, just think about those people who have experienced that what they will think alike and feel like. Generally speaking, this war is changing us. It's not over yet. We cannot talk about the war as in the past. It's still going. It's going to change not just the mayor of the city, of the capital that was almost in Russian army's hands. Almost, almost circled. And um, Life is coming back in the city, but you know what? If you're in Ukraine, you are in a danger zone. As we have experienced that Russian rockets landed in the city just three weeks ago, killing a journalist. And those rockets landed in a residential area of the city, so it's in the center. Can that happen again? The answer is yes. Will that? We don't know, but you must be ready for it. Sirens are daily, hourly going on, and you should run actually in underground for safety, and if you ignore, you might be dead. I, I just think that if we really will understand that 
here in Switzerland, and it doesn't matter where you're coming from, you will just connect yourself with what's going on in Ukraine on different stages, supportive, just being loud on the financial side, on the medical side, humanitarian side, military side, whatever it is, whatever the field you can support, it will change you too. It will change the world. It did change us. We're never going to be the same with perception of life, perception of the world um, as we were. And I'm more than sure, I'm speaking now for you here, um, I'm, I'm more than sure that you never forget those images that we've seen in Bucha. It's not just the images, but it's in the connection with senses, smell of death. And death is silent. And all those bodies that have been all around the place in uh, satellite cities of, of the capital, you will never forget those images. And who knows what we're going to experience in upcoming days when we're going to return to Ukraine. Nobody knows what the world is going to experience, but we know for sure horrifying images will coming up on, in light. And we must do anything to stop it. Because the world is not going to be the same. We are not going to be the same. We will feel it very soon. I believe this year. By the end of the year, we will feel this war on the economical side. We produce on agricultural side grains and delivering it to Africa and Asia. So the people will starving because they're not going to have enough food that in this supply chain Ukraine was providing for ever. We will feel, feel it because we are in one ecosystem. And if you break this chain and a part of this chain, it's going to collapse eventually. We will feel it. If not now, later. So my answer is, it did change us. It's changing you right now, and it's going to change even more. And I hope for good. I hope that we will learn this lesson. I hope we will solve this challenge. I really believe in this free world. I really believe in us, without exceptions. We will do it. We will make it. Because the good is always conquers the evil. Note, I'd like to open the discussion to the floor. If you have any questions for our speakers, if you could raise your hand, we'll direct the microphone to you and you can ask your question. Thank you. I'm Nick Bilogorski. I'm from San Francisco. I work with the Nova Ukraine charity. My question is, what can we in the States uh, do to help rebuild and recover and reconstruct and renew Ukraine right now, especially in the liberated cities around Kiev, Kharkiv, and other places? How can private individuals, organizations, what's the best way to help? Thank you. Wait a minute, perhaps? Um, so you're from the US, and uh, we've lived there, worked there, um, children were born there, so it's, um, I totally understand where you're from and how you feel, more or less. I just want to say thank you to your countryman, in particular, Michael Dell, Dell Computers. We are living in the digital world that help us to collect, for instance, collect the evidence of a war crime that already happened with the surveillance cameras, with the footage that is observing, collecting, documenting. Digital world is helping us to prevent as a prevention. If something is gonna happen, a destruction, identify fire, identify in the right place and send um, a fire department there, identify people 
that um, can cause or do any jeopardy to the society. Digital world is self-learning world, artificial intelligence. And speaking of, of Michael Bell in this case, from the first day, as soon as that was asked to support us, it's been provided. Not just on the IT side with the hardware, but also on the soft side, and also financially. And I just want to say thank you. It's a great example. And if you do something good, and I've met a lot of you, if you do something good, talk about it. Don't be shy. Do you know why? Because it's complimentary. You've done well. You motivate others. Do the same. And if you just do it, but don't talk about it, it's kind of not really getting into attention. And I think it's motivational to repeat, like my neighbor done it, my friend done it, or I've heard from someone is doing it, and I'm going to be part of it. Entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, as we know, you understand that you're a part, you're a small puzzle, but in a big puzzle, you're part of something big. And this part of something big is, contains from something like you. So do something f for the bigger part. Do your part. And uh, thank you for your countrymen. And I don't know if you're active, but if you will change your mind and be active, thank you. And thank you if you've done something to support us. Whatever it is, any help is needed. Thank you. Um, the lady in stripes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lorena. I'm Austrian and currently living in Switzerland. Um, Fifteen years ago, I started to box in a semi-professional team, and you were my heroes over there. <laughs> my career and also my hobbies have changed quite a bit ever since, and obviously yours have too. I was wondering, given your previous career and also the path ever since, what prepared you the most for the role you're currently in, not only on this stage, but on a global political level? And what type of recommendations would you give to young adults and students out there preparing for their challenges ahead of them? Can I give the answer? Yeah. Whoever wants, <laughs> your choice. Very short to answer. As former athlete, boxer, I tell you, it's, uh, people think it's, uh, make mistake. Uh, they think it's size is very important. How big are you? How strong are you? Is not. In every competition, in every battle, total different strengths. Much more. It's not important how big are you and how strong are you. The will. The will to win, and it's very important. The spirit of fighter is very important point. Uh, it's uh, is a play priority right now in in uh, uh, in current situation. Also, the every Ukrainian want win this war. One example. I like this life. I like life story. Morning, eight, eight o'clock. Morning in my office. I received a call. The uh, Russian racket landed in the apartment building. I go immediately there. Together with Vladimir, he look at my back. And uh, immediately there, huge apartment building. I don't know. It's twelve. Stores, huge hall, everything burning. It's man around 60, 65 coming to me, and and he was. I was surprised. He was uh, 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 not happy, but he's smiling. He told, "Mr. Mayor, look in this hall. It was my apartment. Thanks God, five minutes before I go out." I still alive. 
what I have do what I have to do right now. I tell him, listen, uh, you are at now. Uh, you are now homeless. We give you the, the uh, we equate you to the safe, uh, safe part of uh, country or somewhere out uh, out of the country. We give you full support. They told me the the his answer was shocked me. Sorry, I spent in this city all my life. He lived my relatives, my friends. I don't want to leave. Premier. If you can, please, please, can you give me a weapon? He asked me about the weapon. Spirit, the will. The Russians attack the apartments, building civilians. They uh, think the people will be in panic. They will be depressed. It's not. People is angry. Angry and ready to fight in blog post i was very surprised i see the people with new in uniform with weapons in hands i talk to them very peaceful profession they never expect in the life to take the weapons in the hands but right now they take them musicians actors doctors spirit and will because it's our home country because it's our family it's our children and our future next question please i'll get to the back slightly later we'll just take a question from this gentleman uh, um, we doesn't have uh, so much time uh, my proposal can we uh, collect uh, two questions. three two three okay. uh, questions to give the answer that, yeah. Go ahead. So a, a short uh, comment and question. So we at the AO Foundation, we're teaching online courses to your surgeons at the moment to deal with uh, war extremities. They're watching them underground. They're learning from this. And so are your nurses, ORP professionals. But we also get these translated by Russian doctors who are helping us and are helping you, but they're too scared to say anything in Russia. What can these people do? We'll take that question and we'll take uh, another question at the back, please. Yes, first of all, big respect to brothers, big respect to Ukrainian people. My question is, um, why do you refer to Vladimir Putin as Mr. Putin? My question is, why does international media respect to Putin, say President Putin? Everybody knows that Russian democracy is a joke, a bad joke. When do you start talking about a dictator or murderer? What would be your present uh, uh, term for this man? One more question at the front here, please, in blue. Um, I'm, I'm friends with Alexander Kessler that I think is working with Vladimir, and I know that you're interested in things like leadership development and you know, uh, human development. So I wonder, first of all, how do you see the psychological development of people in Ukraine going forward, right? Because it's a very traumatic event. But second of all, psychological development of everyone here, right? And everyone else in the world, because I feel like, you know, we need to grow as people uh, to move past this and to learn this lesson, as you say. Let's take the last question first. Um, so, um, speaking of colleagues from Russia that on the medical side trying to help save lives, and that's what doctors do, that's um, the job. Doesn't matter nationality, doesn't matter, so doctors do their job. Um, and uh, I, I, I've, I had this experience with people from Russia, Russian people, my friends that have been known for a long time. All of a sudden, they just don't name the war, war. They say a conflict. Um, in other words, so just name as it is. It's a war, and you can say you're, you're against it. Just say it. Don't be afraid. We were even in the group, 
you know, so group like WhatsApp group and so and and I couldn't find those Russian friends anymore in those groups. I and and that's how Russian state. Um, and I will probably connect those two questions. Uh, Russian state and dictatorship of Putin is Mr. He's not Miss, so I have to call him Mr. All right, don't be upset about that. Um, and ambitious of building something that Putin, President Putin, he's president, he's not prime minister, you have to call him a president. And he's leading the country, and he's the leader, and he was, he was calling this war. Um, and I remember it was as, as millions of Ukrainians glued to TV when he actually declared the war. Putin, as a president, declared the war to Ukraine. They called and called it a special operation that it was renamed uh, denazification, that it was re re renamed um, the fight against NATO. And there's always something new because uh, you must be creative if you provide lies and change your mind and, uh, and your, your intelligence give you wrong information and you need to find an exit of, of the situation because it's so obvious this is so wrong. And in, if the talk helps to stop this war, you're going to do anything to stop it. And then later on, international court, not me, international court must take action and we must have this as an example for now and the future generations. And that's why just name it the way it is. It's a war crime. What, Ru what Russia, what Putin, what President Putin has started, it's a war crime. It's against the population. It's against our principles. It's against life in general. Because life is getting destroyed with the infrastructure. And catastrophic things will come up because there's so much we cannot get behind it and fix it because we're getting over 2,000 rockets being launched from Belarus, not to forget Belarus, from Belarus and Russia. Rockets that have been taking our life of the Ukrainians and destroyed infrastructure that is so crucially important. And that's why in, in, in this way, I, I would say that lies, what is it in German? There are probably uh, Germans here too that understand it's a German saying. Das Lügen hat kurze Beine. So the lies having short legs. So you cannot run far and quick. So, but they've been very successful with that. Um, they, meaning Russia in this case, with propaganda, with everything that I saw this morning on TV. Um, and they're still going, but eventually it will have an end. It will have an end. That's what you, we usually hear um, in Ukraine. It's not just in the city of Kiev, but in Ukraine in general. And then you, you hear the explosions and you, you, you're like, you're recognizing, is it a launch anti-aircraft strike? So it's an exit or it's in? You just like recognize like on the, on the sound. Was it landing or it was launching? Um, and then the third question, and I'm sorry, I'm taking all this, all, all this time. Um, Alexandra Kessler, um, fantastic lady. Um, we've been working for four years and um, she's, um, she's doing, been doing and continue doing a great job on facing the challenges and as the methodology that has been taught for the past seven years here in St. Gallen University, the methodology that I've created. And she's the, the one who was defending her PhD and very dedicated to this methodology as well that helps us in Ukraine, our military, our doctors, our, our teachers, not to forget that. Our kids cannot get education, so it's kind of online. And I've seen those professors um, on the front line giving images giving lessons and lectures to the students. So you need to be so agile and the principles of the face the challenge methodology, 
methodology focus, agility, coordination, and endurance. All of those principles, as a military man, woman, you need it. In war, in peace, in whatever you want to rebuild after the war, you need those principles, all of them, with endurance, tremendous endurance, and agility. So thank you. We're there was a question Good in time. how do you build the psychological psychology of the people? We do in, uh, we have not so much time because we have to move. And, uh, our, we plan um, uh, 30 minutes right now, already one hour. Uh, we explain about the whole situation. We're doing everything in Ukraine, you in Swiss, never hear the Syria. Syrian. It's mean in any second the racket a bomb can land in your building. It's not so far, it's not so far from here. It's very close. It's very close and everyone from you have to understand it. We do it everything to stop this senseless war, to stop the people. In this minute if we talk, I don't know, I'm more than sure in this minute, I talked to the people in the east of Ukraine, in this mi minute killed in this hour, maybe 10 people, killed, young people, who have plans in their life, who don't want to, to die, but we, please, don't forget defending Every one of you with this war, against this war. And uh, we very appreciate, please be proactive, do it everything what is possible to stop this war. By the way, right now the uh, uh, Swiss TV asks what uh, have to do with Swiss, stop the Russian propaganda. The main weapon right now, not the uh, rockets, not the planes and tanks. Main weapons is the media. 70% in Russian Federation, 70% of the population support the war against Ukraine. Can you imagine? The people is armed from media. Just one TV channel. Russian TV channel, Russia Today, have more budget than capital of Ukraine, more than $2 billion. U.S. dollar. Ukraine uh, washing is worked so hard, and that's why we have to stop that. It's the main weapons. It's the war static already. If uh, you have TV, Russian TV channels already here, some the people, and uh, by the way, we do have everything from the pen for us to defend our country, to defend democracy, to defend our future, and defend every one of you. But we need your support. Thank you very much for everyone who stay with Ukraine. The unity around Ukraine is a key for peace. Slava Ukraini.